Hello and welcome to the Shaman's Cave. Hi everyone, I'm Sandra Ingerman and welcome to the Shaman's Cave. And I'm Renee Barabo. And before we get into the topic, I'm I'm giving a shameless pitch. And I don't think that there's so much shame to it, but you know, for five years uh, we've been doing these podcasts and we hardly, we ask for very little in exchange, but I'm asking for a favor. I'm in the process of uh, pitching my book to a new publisher and I want to uh, up my book sales by about 1500 And so I'm asking you to go over to Amazon or to your favorite bookstore and order a copy of Winds of Spirit. And if you've already bought one, thank you very much. But maybe buy one for a friend. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I want to say about Renee's book is um, um, uh, this is how the Shaman's Cave actually was born. Uh, Renee didn't know me and, and she knew who I was, but I, I hadn't met Renee yet. And she sent me a, a message through Facebook Messenger and said, I have a book coming out. Uh, are you willing to um, look at it and endorse it? And so um, at the time, I, I kind of thought about it, not, not because I didn't want to uh, endorse Renee's book. It was I have to I have to be careful how many books I say yes to because I'll, I'll just put my whole life will just be reading other people's books. I won't be able to eat anything. And so I said yes. And so uh, I'm one of those people who read a whole book before I endorse it because I want to know what I'm putting my name to. And so I read the whole entire book and I was amazed. I was so amazed. I mean, I kept saying to my husband, this is the most amazing book. I'm so touched by this book. I'm just so touched by it. And um, and Renee and I, um, we did a couple of interviews together and all of a sudden I said to her, Renee, I really like you. I think we should do something together. And and what we ended up doing together was birthing the shaman's cave. And that all came from a beautiful connection between uh, myself and Renee. I was so enamored um, with her work. And the the tough thing for authors, and maybe this is just part of our show, um, uh, the tough thing for authors, and I have a lot of friends who we, we talk about the same thing, where we have websites where we offer um, online courses that, you know, evergreen that you could buy, books that you can buy. And what we all find is everybody wants to be on our Facebook pages and everybody loves the free ceremonies that we do you know, for the equinoxes and solstices, they show up, anything free people show up for. And, um, but to actually go to uh, that teacher's website and say, it was a free event. How could I give thanks back to that free event? Maybe I could buy a book, maybe I could buy um, a CD, maybe I could subscribe in some way to a newsletter and that that might be a way of giving back. And it's interesting, we talk about it a lot among shamanic teachers. It's an interesting psychology in our culture where um, people don't want to give back. Um, they just want, uh, they just want what they can get. And I understand it on a lot of levels as, um, I was so broke for so many years and mostly homeless that, yeah, I'd be going for free events and I wouldn't be buying anything. But I, I think that um, in the culture that we're living in, um, people aren't making shamanism practical, uh, which is um, part of what we want to be talking about because we're going so quickly from one free event to another 
that we're, we don't actually have a path we're walking on. You know, we're, we're, we're splitting ourselves like into little uh, fairy stars that are all over the place and beautiful to look at. The light is really beautiful, but where's the substance? Um, and, and so it, it's just, it's just an interesting time. I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at that point where at some point in the next few years I'll be retiring. So these issues aren't as personally big to me because I had a different culture that I, I worked with. It was a different time on the planet, but I can really see how um, teachers, um, I can see how teachers are struggling right now because of, of uh, doing so much free stuff that uh, they can't pay rent. Um, so it's an interesting issue. It's just an interesting issue. Well, it looks like we, we moved into the topic of the practical shaman, which we were going to talk about. So it's perfect. And if you can see, um, I don't know if you can see it in the background here, there's a big pot on the stove. And the big pot is because my neighbor's daughter is having a baby shower today. And he's there like, oh, maybe I need to buy the potato salad. And I said, well, maybe I'll make the potato salad. And to me, that's the essence of what you're talking about. They in Peru, they call it an Aini today for me, tomorrow for you. And that's that's the way that I choose to live my life. And it's not always convenient. Last week, you know, I'm in the middle of writing a book, uh, a neighbor, a friend on the island had an emergency and I was called into action. And what do I do? I put down my writing and I actually went over and sat with somebody who, who really needed, really needed me. And, you know, what needed me more was that their partner was, you know, in a different state and couldn't get home quick enough. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's like you, you there's a issue, difference between giving codependently and giving because you're called into service and knowing the, those differences to become really um, profound and really important. And and that's what that's how to make your work more practical for me. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think that, um, you know, uh, when, when I was, um, teaching shamanism in the, you know, in, in, in the time, uh, where I was on the road all the time and had no other life but teaching, um, again, it was a completely different population of people. And so we were really interested in the healing methods of shamanism, and we still are. I am, I am everybody. I'm setting dates uh, now for my advanced shamanic healing training in, um, in 2024 in Santa Fe, New Mexico for next year. And so I'm still into the shamanic healing part of the work. And we were also into, um, God, we did these unbelievable practices in our workshops, you know, how close can we get to death and how close can we do this and can we fly, can we levitate? I remember being at a workshop with a, a teacher who he was so obsessed about levitating for five days, that's all we tried to do. And the craziest thing was we were eating hamburgers and french fries at lunch and then he expected us to levitate. <laughs> It's so funny to me. I could. <laughs> so that's what shamanism was it, when I was, you know, in the height of my teaching. How far could we go? How much could we experiment? And, um, you know, people would be climbing on walls, you know, the spirits are pulling me up. And, um, you know, we, we tried different dances from different um, uh, places and it was always how far could we go but when we look at today's world it's um how how do how do i improve my health and not just by getting a shamanic healing but by the everyday activities i have to do <clears throat> in order to heal my health 
um, how, how do I contribute to um, a healthy planet? I have to go out every day and be part of nature and experience the oneness and experience the beauty of nature so that I really want to be in service to the planet and I want to be able to learn how to sit with somebody who's dying and be a really healing force for them as they make their transition back home. These are the things that pe I see people really uh, working with today, those real practical everyday things, not so much of the experimentation. We don't actually have as much time for the experimentation. We actually have to focus more on the practical aspects of how we can use shamanism as a, a practices for a, a daily life. Mm -hmm. I, I call that the luxury of separation. You know, in the 70s and 80s and 90s, we had good paying jobs that gave us two weeks of vacation to go and have these experiences to learn this. And I do not judge it at all because I think we needed to train the we needed to train the trainers and these trainers then became parents and they became lawyers and they became doctors. And so we, we brought it to a level of expectancy like that. This is now here we have we, we're, we're our nature is changing around us every single day but we have the tools and a lot of us were you know the pioneers um i know for you for sandra that you were out there teaching as a pioneer while while some of us were you know still on the struggle bus with it but there but now i don't think we have as much luxury and much time to go off for a, you know a month in india and, and levitate i think that we've got really important issues of you know that that there's people who are really sick and dying because of all the pollution we have on the earth or we have you know people who are without homes or or a whole generation who doesn't know how they're going to get a home i mean there's really pressing and it really feels like it's pressing up against me lately like you know like last week it was like the stress of what was pressing up against me and it was like if i look around in my life everything's everything's good right <laughs> you know, i got a little foot problem and i've got you know like little aches and pains but but everything is really good but there's still this pressure mounting and i think that that's the nature coming in and causing this contraction against us to to become more less isolated and come back into this experience as what is a practical shaman right yeah and and nature is also forcing us through climate change mm -hmm. um, to look at how to be a practical shaman um uh you know in the medicine for the earth work that i teach um and um, Medicine for the Earth was a book that um, I was advertising on the emails for a while. It's the most esoteric book, most spirit driven book I, I ever wrote, but it's it's a book for those who are called to it. Um, you know, you have to have a calling to it. Yeah. And um, and, you know, I, I wrote so much about um, how um, we're going to have to have to connect with nature and have to be able to change our lives because i feel i've always felt that the new kids that are going to be coming in not now the, a lot of the new kids coming in are coming in pretty ill but i believe there's going to be a time when the new babies coming in are going to have mutations in their organs where they can handle the pollution um, that has been created on this great earth, but for us, and so I started teaching medicine for the earth in 2000. And so what I started saying to the group is think of how old you are. You're not a new baby. That's going to come in mutated. You have what you have, um, what, you, what your genetics gave you. And no, none of us were given the genetics to, eat the pollution that we're eating, drink 
the pollution that we're um, drinking and breathe the pollution that we're breathing. We actually don't have the bodies that know how to do that. So how I'm seeing things right now, and maybe it sounds crazy to some of you, but this is how I'm living my life, is that a lot of issues that we're facing are physically unfixable, but they're spiritually fixable. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I'm looking at um, and teaching again, the real beginning foundations of uh, medicine for the earth, when you drink water, uh, perceive it as light. Your perception creates your reality. If you perceive it as polluted and poisonous, you're, you're drinking poison and you're going to get sick. And so if we remember that our perception creates our reality, then we can start to see that with spiritual practices, we can transmute what we're taking in um, and learning how to stay healthy. And that's practical because we have to stay in the moment. Um, we really have to stay in the moment to be able to do practices like that. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to this thought of, not a, of, of taking that a step further, that remember, if you're listening to this show, you know, you are a way shower for somebody else who's not listening to this show. And, you know, everywhere I show up in, in my life, I bring this, you know, I don't wear a badge. I don't wear, hang a shingle out on the door. By golly, most people don't even know what I do because I run a marketing department at a behavioral health care organization. But I bring that energy of cooperation and INI and give back into the organization I lead or the, you know, the bringing the potato salad to the shower today or going to sit with a neighbor. It's the esoteric is fine, but you know what? And Sandra, you know this, God does not need healers to heal. It, last week I had this profound prophetic dream in the middle of the night and I wasn't having a shamanic session. I wasn't doing anything. It was just like, boom. <laughs> it was like, I didn't ask for it. It just came. And so there's this whole understanding that the nature will take care of you if you show up and cooperate. You know, last, a couple of weeks ago, this man hit a tree down the road and unfortunately he died. God, God rest his soul. But about a week later, a tree like on the next block fell over. And I'm there like, well, why did that tree fall over? And somehow that tree must have been related to the tree that he knocked over with his car. And, you know, however trees communicate under the ground, and it just fell over. And I took it to heart like, wow, trees are falling over for no, no apparent reason. It could be connected to the guy who hit the other tree or not, but this is the way that as a shamanic practical shaman that I have to look at the nature that's informing me in my neighborhood. So I went on upon closer inspection, the tree was rotted from the inside out. Oh, wow. Right. It was like, so are we rotting from the inside out or are we nurturing ourselves so that we're not decaying from the inside. And I'm really lately trying to look at everything I do in my life as how am I reflecting the trees and the water and the air around me? Because isn't that what living a nature informed life means? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think for me, um, I'm looking at, uh, and I, I've never done this before, but before everything I do, no matter, no matter what it is, I ask myself the question, do I have the energy for that? Mm -hmm. And that's something I've learned from nature too, is if you try to push a plant, you try to push a, a tree too much, you know, nature also responds to stress, just like human beings respond to stress. So before I do everything, 
anything, I say, do I have the energy to be doing this? And it's amazing to me how much I've let go of. And what I've mostly let go of is mental things that I'm angry about. I ask myself, do I have the energy to put into this anger or this being mad at somebody right now? And it's like, I actually don't have the, I don't have enough energy for it. So I just let it go. So I'm actually finding myself being a little bit more peaceful than I've ever been because I don't have the energy to do anything more, but to be in a state of peace. <laughs> well, that sounds good. Last night I was doing a, um, a Diksha meditation that I do on a regular basis, but I, unfortunately I had five extra minutes and I read a news a newsletter right be uh bef the, an email right before i started so i was obsessing during the entire breathing thing and then i just at some point i laughed at myself and said well clearly this is the healing you need today and i thought to myself like yeah that's the that's the psychic shift that's needed in this moment is how much time do i spend obsessing about the incompetence of, of the world around me like i mean i was fighting with, with xfinity this week and you know when people tenants moving in tenants moving out it's like how much time are we fighting against the river here of these corporations that may or may not go anywhere but are we fighting against them or are we you know like saying oh my god look at how silly i am again as a human having this <laughs> this right. experience couldn't i rather go out and, and garden in the yard type of thing but that those are the experiences and we need to use our tools i had to laugh at myself in the middle of a meditation and say well look at how silly you're being and right. it doesn't really matter in 10 years no right right yeah so I know this sounds mundane, everyone, but this is how practical our practices need to come. Yes, there's the magic of when we pull into the parking lot and in the busiest zoo and get a parking space. That's really good. But make sure you say thank you. <laughs> That's the nature, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot for us to really. Um, I think that. Um, I think people are, are really um, doing good work now, um, but everybody's trying to find their way, you know, which is really important. And so um, every way leads to the same place. There isn't a path that leads you to a different place. And so it's really about finding um, a path that brings you joy, that brings you passion, that you really love to do. And then finding simple practices that put you back into present moment. Because in the present moment, we're informed constantly by nature, we're informed constantly from any spiritual connections we have. We're being formed by our ancestors, we're being informed by um, we're being informed by life itself mm -hmm. and and that takes some um, letting go of the distractions and bringing ourselves present and i know we talk about that a lot but we also i'm also reading um so much about how um people in younger generations who still have an active life um they can't deal with the distractions anymore they can't deal with the distractions and feel like they can have a life um so so it, it's it's a big topic for all of us of we've been living in this world where everything is work 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 20, 24 7. um you got fired if you put your cell phone down at three o'clock in the morning i mean that was really going on for a while and then all of a sudden we've been stopped cold and all of a sudden we're looking at how much activity keeps us healthy and how much rest do we need and setting all the boundaries that every nature being already knows innately we're first learning for ourselves as adults mm -hmm. so it's an interesting time <laughs> 
really is. So if you're in doubt, watch a flower. It curls up at night and goes, you know, and they'll come back out in the morning. And, you know, that's what we're encouraging to, you to do. And you're going to hear more. I mean, after five years, there's a lot of topics we're repeating. But remember, we're having this conversation for ourselves as well, you know, to how how we're we're all on this voyage alone, we're together and alone. Um, I posted something last week that the views from the crow's nest is the same, no matter what your spiritual path, but make sure you have a spiritual path. And these reminders are simple and profound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I find the simpler, the absolute simplest exercises are the most profound. <laughs> Sure. And so the simple exercise this week is to order a copy of Winds of Spirit so that, you know what, my first book did really well. According to how book sells these days, I, I'm very excited about it. But my goal is, is to get another 1,500 copies sold before I send out my book proposal, which is a book called The Practical Shaman, towards the new, towards for a new publisher and for you readers and for the people you know who are going to need our work. So support our work so we can support you. And another way to do this um, too, which is going to lead into another show, is um, use your imagination. And, and if you love Renee, and I hear on YouTube and on The Shaman's Cave that you love Renee, Let's all imagine uh, Renee being on a Shaman's Cave show saying, I sold way more than those 1,500 copies. I cannot believe how people came through for me. And we all clap and celebrate. And that is, an, that is a, a, a way to manifest success that's been used for thousands of years. <laughs> so um, blessings, everyone. <laughs> Thank you.